Hello, everybody. I am Boz. I've been at Facebook since before it was cool. Uh, you know that because when I started, it was still the Facebook. It's before Justin Timberlake sorted us out. <laughs> Over my time, I've worked on newsfeed, messenger, and groups. And today, I lead ads, pages, platform, and local. And my team's work sits at the intersection of people and businesses, which is really the intersection of, of people in the real world around them. And that puts us at the epicenter of the ongoing mobile revolution. Now, some say the revolution is past. They speak about it in the past tense. They describe the winners and losers. Those people are wrong. We're standing here, it's 2016, today, and I'm telling you, the mobile revolution has just begun. Now, mobile is a piece of the future that we can all see coming. That's true. But its biggest impacts are yet to be seen. And the only question those of us here today get to answer is this one. Will we innovate to take advantage of this change? Or will we stand by and let the tide wash over us? Today, I'm going to talk about innovation, what it is, what it isn't, how to recognize it when it shows up on your doorstep wearing a hoodie. Now, some of you might be looking for marketing tips about how to turn passion into action. That sounds like a tagline for Tinder. It's not what this talk is about. This talk is about something bigger. I'm going to talk about real opportunities for innovation and how to recognize them, not some you know, buzzwordy bullshit. And why the the key to innovation is the one thing that I am confident this audience knows more about than anyone else in the world, the brand. But first, let's get started with the history lesson, shall we? I want to take you guys back to the 19th century. I'm going to do a little call and response here. I want you to shout it out when you have it. What were the biggest industries in industrial era New England? Textiles, really good, right off the top. Little, little hint from the photo, I think, but okay, we'll give it to you. What? Ice, that's an incredible, incredible answer. The reason it's incredible is it's absolutely true. Ice. Ice making was one of industrial New England's biggest industries. In fact, some of America's richest families who lived in the stateliest manners were the barons of the ice trade, which is a great name for a band, if anyone's looking. <laughs> in fact, there's ice history right here in New York, corner of 57th and 5th, can't make this stuff up, right where Trump Tower is today, was the site of the mansion of Charles W. Morse, wait for it, the ice king of New York, <laughs> the kingpin of the New York ice cartel. Now, how did they make ice in the 19th century? This is before refrigeration. Well, I'll tell you how. You got yourself a saw, you got out to a frozen lake, and you got to cutting. Literally go out to the Hudson River and carve up giant chunks of ice put them on a horse cart, and take them to market. It was a lot of labor, so ice was a luxury item. But then in a pattern all too familiar to those of us in Silicon Valley, an entrepreneur came along who had changed the ice-making game. A Florida doctor by the name of John Gorey, pictured here, patented the first refrigeration technique in the United States, 1851, pre-Civil War. Got himself a nice little write-up in Scientific American and everything. Well, that little article caught the attention of the ice barons up in their ice palaces. Now, what do you think the ice barons did with that information? Did they buy his patent? Did they incubate it as an idea of bringing ice to the masses without having to carve up frozen lakes? <laughs> no. No, they saw his device as a threat, and they went full Luddite on it. When Dr. John Gorey went to New Orleans to seek venture capital, the ice barons sabotaged him behind closed doors. John Gorey died a broke and broken man. And everyone went back to drinking their Hudson, Lake, Hudson River iced tea. Excuse me. But that only delayed the inevitable. As the technology got cheaper and cheaper, the ice lobby fought a PR war against it. They said lake ice was natural. It cleaned the air. Why not? Still, the technology got better and better cheaper and cheaper, and no one's drinking Hudson River ice anymore. Now, 
the ice barons, why didn't they capitalize on that ice machine? You know, refrigeration has been a huge boon to the global economy. Refrigerated cargo containers are the cornerstone of globalization. Refrigerators are a boon to health and nutrition everywhere. And air conditioning ain't too bad either. If they had pivoted, these once great ice companies could have brought all of this to the world and profited from all of it. But instead, they're a punchline in my talk. That's cold. <laughs> a lot more where that came from. Stay with me. So why didn't the ice barons embrace the ice machine? For that matter, why do we fly United instead of Union Pacific? Why aren't my, why aren't my Instagram filters branded by Kodak? It's not because companies like these, heads of their industries, were too big. Failure to innovate is not a function of size. It's a function of vision, of who you are, of how you're structured, and how far you're willing to go. So here's how it works. The innovation pivot is a three-step dance. First, you have to understand what it is you actually do. Then you have to structure yourself for change and innovation. And finally, you have to commit to the change. You have to take risk. Let's go through these one at a time, starting with the first. Understanding what it is that you actually do. You know, this sounds simple, but I think it's, I think it's actually the toughest one. I want to give another example from New England. You know, the first oil companies in America didn't come from Texas and California. They came from places like Nantucket and New Bedford. They were whale oil companies. They hunted whales and mined oil out of their heads. It's a bit gruesome if you ask me, but I'm told it was quite good oil, burned clean and bright. And the whale game was real money. So why aren't there any whale barons today? Well, the whale oil companies missed a key lesson, and it was this. They didn't sell whale oil. They sold heat and light. And so when some entrepreneurs started digging petroleum out of the ground and refining it into cheaper kerosene, you know, these uh, masters of whaledom fought it in the press as dark and dirty rather than embracing innovation. Within a decade, they'd be out of business. You know, Kodak actually invented the world's first digital camera in the 1970s. They invented it. If they had pressed on that innovation, they would have been decades ahead of their competitors. But they passed on it. They didn't think people would want to look at photos on screens. And besides, they were making a ton of money selling film. But film wasn't really their product. They sold memories. And within a couple of decades, they'd be out of business because they passed on the opportunity to shape the future. Companies often miss their moment, not just because they're stuck in the present time. They're stuck in something even more fundamental than that, which is an inflexible conception of what it is that they do. We all know the standard barriers to innovation, legal, social, technological. But the biggest barrier is ideological. And it has to do with identity. Look, I don't want to get all burning man on you guys here, but what you do for the world isn't necessarily the same as what you sell. What you do is more fundamental than that. It's defined by the value you create for people in the world. You know, it's not the item people are buying, it's why they're buying. It's not what people are paying you for, it's the reason that they're paying you in the first place. That's what the ice barons didn't get, or the whalers, the railroaders, the people who sold film. They let changes in technology pass them by because they were stuck in rigid ways of self-identification. They became their product, not their service. They were what they did. They were what they sold, not what they did. They identified with their past and their present at the expense of their future. Now, I've talked a lot about other companies, but even Facebook faced this challenge. When I joined in 2006, we were a college-only social network. And there was a huge debate inside the company about whether or not we should open up. Now, this may sound crazy given how things have turned out, 
but a lot of very smart people believed it would kill the company to open up beyond colleges. So how do we decide to do it? Well, we realized something very important. Our product is connection. So if we pass up on any opportunity to connect people, we're just letting our customers down today and giving fuel to our competitors to beat us with tomorrow. And look, I'm probably being a little too hard on the railroaders and the whalers, and I'm definitely being too hard on Kodak. Retrospect is an incredibly privileged position from which to judge. I get that. It's never easy to see the future coming. I think this current election season is proof enough of that. So in the absence of having a fortune teller, it only makes sense that companies would continue to invest in those things that are making them money today. So Kodak gets a pass. It would have been impossible to predict smartphones sitting way back in 1970. But for those of us here in 2016, we have no such excuse. Mobile is a piece of the future that we can all see coming. Half the presentations here have been about mobile. None of you can look back in a couple years and say, boy, those smartphones, you know, who knew? They're a big deal, they're coming. So all we can do is work to take advantage of them. So don't be bound by your identity today. See opportunity in change, glory in crisis. And if you do, you won't get frozen out. It's another ice joke, there's a lot more. Stay with me. <laughs> that brings me to my next key point. Once you figure it out what it is you actually do for the world, you have to set yourself up for change and innovation. And it starts with the organization of your organization. Let me give you another example from Facebook. You know, we now have about a billion people a day using Facebook on mobile. But back when I started, we didn't have a mobile site. We didn't have a mobile app. Facebook was desktop only. Now, to be fair, back then you couldn't really do that much on your phone. You could make phone calls, which is actually pretty novel. Do you guys remember phone calls? That was a thing back then. You could maybe play yourself a game of Snake if you had a good Nokia phone. But that was about it. But then the ground started to shift when the iPhone came out. And by 2012, more than half of our users were using Facebook on a mobile device. But we continued to focus on desktop. We had hundreds of engineers working on Facebook.com and like 30 engineers trying to replicate that experience for mobile. Now just think about that. We were asking 30 people to replicate the work of hundreds of people. It doesn't add up. So we made a change. If connection is our product, we had to be honest with ourselves that mobile phones were gonna be far better tools for connections than desktops were. So we changed the org structure. Instead of having a small mobile team, we made every team responsible for both the desktop and mobile versions of their products. In fact, Mark would end any meeting immediately if somebody pre presented him an idea and didn't have a mobile prototype. It was hard, but it changed the culture. We became mobile first, and engagement took off. You know, a lot of people were expecting us to go the way of MySpace and Friendster, and it didn't happen, but it could have. But it didn't happen, <laughs> but it could have. <laughs> to pick a parallel example from the ads industry, if you have a mature traditional ads team and a small digital ad team, you've got to ask yourself, are they really set up to succeed? I mean, every other money-making status quo part of your organization is fully staffed. They're going to look better than that understaffed digital stylo. They're just not structured to bring about the change of the order required by the shift to mobile. You know, just like our siloed mobile team couldn't keep up, us up to speed on mobile, neither can your siloed digital ad team. The organization matters, and therefore the integration matters. New ideas need to be given room to breathe. They can't be siloed in some innovation division, given just enough oxygen to prove the naysayers right. So don't silo innovation, integrate it. 
And that brings me to my third point. Real pivots require, require real commitment. Now imagine Southern Pacific Railroads had decided to get into the airplane business. So they set aside a small airplane division, say 30 people, to go explore with small craft. That never would have been enough to recognize the dream of air travel we all know today. All that approach does is prove that that business doesn't work at small scale. All that approach does is get you close enough to see the summit that you're not dedicated enough to climb. Zuck has this quote I love, which is that companies fail in one of two ways. They either set ambitious goals and fail to hit them, or they set safe goals and hit them all the way down to obsolescence. Most companies fail in the second way. You know, there's a lot of talk in Silicon Valley about pivots. I know. I know this talk has had a lot of talk about pivots. I've pivoted all over the stage. It's maybe getting towards a meaningless jargon term at this point, but what it's getting at is this. There will come a point where you have to make a change to the core of how your business operates. And when that time comes, you can't half-ass it. You have to go all in on that change. There's another quote I like by a marketer in the 1920s by the name of John Shedd. A ship is safe in harbor, but that's not what ships are for. And it reminds me that sometimes the riskiest thing is not to risk everything, or at least to risk more than you're comfortable risking. Growth happens in places of deep discomfort and nowhere else. So how are we incorporating this at Facebook? Well, you might ask yourself a question. You say, Facebook's a social network. What's it doing building a fleet of solar-powered aircraft? Why do they have such a giant team working on artificial intelligence? Why did they acquire Oculus? Well, as it turns out, our mission is to make the world more open and connected. Our product is connection. So we're investing in airplanes to help bring connectivity to some of the four billion people still offline today. And we're investing in artificial intelligence because we want to connect people across language barriers, across disabilities, and surface information in the most meaningful and natural way possible. And eventually, we want to allow, to allow people to share meaningful experiences without the barrier of physical proximity. We aspire to do for interaction what the telephone did for conversation. And that's why we're investing in virtual reality. And the underlying thread of all of this work is our mission and our brand. Now, I don't have to tell this crowd that brands are not just the names of things. Brands are a technology that has helped humanity scale from a connected village to a connected world. The first thing brands do is convey information about products. They let someone like me know that if I go to a bar in New York City and order a Jack Daniels, it's going to taste just as good as it would back home in California. Second, they impart some identity. You know, brands are shorthand for specific values. So today I'm wearing Star Wars themed Adidas sneakers. And that says something about me. It says that I'm a nerd. And I'm okay with that. But brands also do one more important thing. As technology changes, brands are what allow companies to change with it. You see, brands are a technology of persistence. They communicate quality identity across products and into entirely new markets. They're the thing that allows your product, your company, to evolve with the inevitable progress and time. It's what allows us to pursue connection at Facebook across so many different media. And it's what will sustain us as the times continue to change. I'll leave you with one of my favorite examples, actually, the incredible and somewhat sordid history of Nintendo. Now, if you're like me, you grew up playing Nintendo video games. Uh, whenever I pack the car, I can't help but overhear the Tetris music. Just me? OK, fine. Like I said, nerd. Um, so, so what was interesting about Nintendo is they actually go back to the 19th century. They used to make playing cards for a Japanese game called Hanafuda, which was popular with the Yakuza, as it turns out. After that, they made noodle soup. 
They made ballpoint pens. They made toy blocks. They made a hilarious little grabber arm thing, which was apparently incredibly popular. Then video games, and now they're back on top with their AR hit, Pokemon Go. All under the Nintendo brand. As technology changes, brands are going to be the thing that allows us to change with them and allows companies to adapt to keep up with the times. Another one of my favorite quotes is this classic by Henry Ford, who said, if I had asked people what they, would have, what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. I love this quote. It's almost too perfect. Because it is too perfect. There is absolutely no evidence that Henry Ford ever said that quote. So, uh, you know, check your sources. Don't trust a guy with a slide deck. <laughs> but even if it's not a real quote, it's still a true quote. Great ideas are going to sound ridiculous at first. Uh, you know, if you're going to capitalize on the shift to mobile, you have to be ready and willing to be different. You have to understand the framing of your work and how technology could be an advantage instead of a threat. You have to structure yourself to make changes and commit to those changes. Ideally, all under a brand that enables progress. Mobile is a piece of the future that we can see coming. So if you aren't prepared for it, your ice castle isn't just melting, it's on fire. All right, all right. Look, the future is unwritten. The past only feels like a narrative. But the present is too damn exciting to slide into obsolescence, setting mediocre goals. So that's my talk. I'm going to go try to find some ice preferably floating in Jack Daniels, <laughs> and think about the future. Thank you. Bye. That was great. Thanks. Half the audience wants to take you home. So uh, you have time for some, uh, some questions? I do, yeah. All right, let's, uh, let's uh, take, a, take, take a seat. We've got mic runners um, out here, so if you have questions, I'll get it, I'll get it started, though. Um, uh, one thing that has always bothered me about some of the theories uh, of disruption is that publicly traded companies, especially in mature industries, are under very different um, uh, investor expectations and financial expectations than, say, certainly than venture-backed private companies and even publicly traded uh, fast growth companies. So. How, what would, your, what would your guidance be to them? If you've got to hit those uh, uh, quarterly uh, revenue targets, if you've got to hit your profitability targets, you're in a mature industry, how do you go all out and take risks at the same time you've got to make the numbers? Yeah, I mean, I guess I, I somewhat reject the premise. I mean, I think fundamentally what investors want is a rate of return over a long period of time. And if you take a really long view, a five or 10 year view, no one's gonna care if you hit your numbers this quarter if you're out of business next year. Um, and so what I think is, is really respected uh, more broadly and especially with the speed at which technology changes are, are leaders, corporate leaders with real vision and a real willingness to, to put investment behind their ideas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I wanna see if there are uh, questions there because I don't wanna, I don't wanna suck up all the air in the room. Okay, right we've got one right here. Man with a great haircut. There's a whole section of you right there, actually. It's my fan club. Yeah, yeah, this, this is it. We, we planned it especially for you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, VJ from IAB Australia, looking back over the last 10 years, is there anything you'd, uh, you'd do differently? Oh, everything. Uh, yeah, so one of the funny things about developing products um, in, in the digital age, I think especially in the mobile age, is you know all the traditional ideas that we have of product development that maybe came from, from visionaries like, like Steve Jobs, perhaps, is this idea that we would sit in a dark room and, and uh, meditate and come up with the one true product. And that's all wrong. Uh, you know, every time uh, we ship a product that we're proud of, and, and it's V1, and we've just spent months of not sleeping getting it out the door, that's when we start to learn. That's when we, like, we, we begin the process of understanding what this product is, isn't, or could be. Um, and so, yeah, would I do anything differently? Of course, because every product I've ever worked on has been completely wrong um, to start with. But then you get there over time. Let me, let me ask you about one of, uh, one of those. You were the inventor of the news feed. Um, 
you mentioned, you know, in the course of you know, what do you do is one of the big themes. Facebook does connections. But that news feed has become incredibly important as part of connections and also incredibly important as a platform for the distribution of media, which creates all kinds of new pressures. So how do you look on it now when you see Facebook's role in the world in distributing media? Um, how do you see news feed? I guess the word is evolving, but how do you, how do you see? What's yeah. the lens you're looking at newsfeed from now? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a wonderful simplicity that, that I always return to. You know, it can get very confusing to look at the, the Lumascape or look at the media landscape or look at these, the highly interconnected world of content and publishing. Um, but I always return to this wonderful place of simplicity, which is what are humans doing? Like, what is a human trying to do right now? And what, are they, what tools are they using to accomplish that task? And are those tools working for them or not? Um, that's how Newsfeed started. You know, people forget that before Newsfeed, Facebook's homepage was literally just a giant finger that told you how many pokes you had. <laughs> like, that was where we were starting from. And people were spending tons of time going three or four links deep to go profile the profile the profile of their friends to try to remember what had changed. So people were trying to do something. <laughs> and we had given them a terrible tool, and they were still trying to make the best of it. Um, and so that was the inspiration for Newsfeed. It wasn't hard, and I don't think that, you know, it's, I think it was just anyone looking at that would have been like, that's terrible. Let me help you with that. Um, and so the same thing happens whenever I'm thinking about uh, media, whether I'm thinking about uh, the app ecosystem. It's what are humans trying to accomplish, and how can I uh, work with them instead of against them? And, and you can't force them into old ways, you know, that they're going to do what they're going to do. They're fluid in, in the way that water is fluid. And mm. so your, your best opportunity is to try to um, integrate and be a part of that activity or, or, or give them something even better to, to go do something differently rather than trying to fight progress. Great. I have uh, time for one more question from the audience. Anybody? Yep, we've got, we've got one right here. Oh, oh, whoops, sorry. Over there. Back. Sorry. Dan Murphy, Univision. So uh, the two previous guests on stage were asked to address the Facebook uh, stats, and I think it would be remiss of us to not <laughs> permit you to do the same thing. But you talked about innovation and talked about the arc of getting to mature product. So I think it's important for you to talk to accountability and transparency in that uh, lifetime. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, clearly a regrettable mistake to, to the, the, there's four numbers you can have in the world. All four numbers were correct in our system. One is the amount of total time spent viewing a video. One is the time spent by people who qualified as views, so above three seconds. The total number of plays, we would call it, starting from zero seconds. The total number of views, starting from three seconds. Three over three is a fair number. Zero over zero is a, number, a fair number. We did zero over three, and so that's the wrong number. It's a bug in the code, highly regrettable, very embarrassing, and we feel bad about it. The most important thing for us to do is to, try to, is to commit to people that not only, obviously, we will try not to make mistakes, but mistakes, if they do happen, you're going to hear about it from us. Um, and so, you know, as soon as we saw this mistake, we fixed it in the UI, we added a help center article, we added some UI, explained to people the error, and we called our partners. We should have done a fifth thing, which is, which is be proactive with the press, which, which Carolyn talked about yesterday, which we regret not doing. Um, but we did talk to the partners and have it transparency uh, in the actual interface. And that's the commitment we have. You know, obviously, we're going to do everything we can to have no mistakes. It's, it's a good news that all the, all the data, behind, the backing data was good. It was just this one bad piece of math on, on one of the metrics on the page. Um, and, and I encourage people to you know, talk to your clients, talk to your partners, and see how it's affecting them. I think so far, we've, we've had a good set of conversations around that. Um, but that's the best we can offer, is, is just to continue to be earnest and, and be frank with, with the people who depend on us, whether they be customers or marketers, uh, about when we've made a mistake, what the implications are, and, and how we can move forward. Great. Boz, thank you so much. This is a really provocative and enlightening thing. Really great.